And studies tell us we only need eight to 10 minutes a day to get the physical, mental, and neurological benefits of meditation. Yoga Nidra really shines when it comes to improving your sleep, um, restoration of like the tissues of the body, because again, your physical body is like falling, is going to sleep. And anyone who is, you know, a nerd like me, um, and loves like the science of sleep, it gets you to that, like deep sleep state for your body, which is where tissue regeneration is happening. It's so essential for like our hormone function. I mean, that deep sleep also light sleep really important too, because that's where we just rest. So a lot of people come for the physical benefits of like helping to regulate the nervous system, regeneration of the tissues, slowing down, getting rest, and just like chilling out. Welcome to the Health Fix Podcast, where health junkies get their weekly fix of tips, tools, and techniques to have limitless energy, sharp minds, and fit physiques for life. Hey, Health Junkies. On this episode of the Health Fix Podcast, I'm interviewing Kelly Smith, and we're going to be talking about yoga nidra. Kelly is a mom, as well as a globally celebrated yoga and meditation instructor. Now, she's also the founder of Yoga For You and the host of the iTunes chart-topping podcast, Mindful in Minutes and Meditation. Kelly's books, podcasts, and trainings have been featured in places such as NPR, Forbes, Yoga Journal, Meditation Magazine, and the Lavender Lifestyle YouTube channel. And now she's going to be on the health fix. Now, prior to my interview with Kelly, I had never tried yoga nidra. So Kelly was like, you got to do this before you air this podcast. And sure enough, I tried it out. Now, the first time I fell deep asleep, which is kind of funny. You'll hear why in the podcast. And then the second round, I felt the feels, felt the emotions, loved how my body felt while it was asleep and my conscious mind was awake because that is the concept of yoga nidra. Body goes to sleep, conscious mind comes up with things for you. Kind of cool. So the woman next to me on the airplane where I tried it probably thought I was nuts, but that's okay. I don't mind. You know why? It felt really good and I was totally relaxed and joyful since that was the purpose of the particular yoga nidra meditation. So let's introduce you to Kelly Smith so you can learn more about yoga nidra and guided meditation. Let's get on with the podcast. Kelly Smith, welcome to the Health Fix Podcast. Hi, how are you doing? Oh my goodness. Well, good. Even better now that I'm chatting with you. We have had such a lovely conversation already. So (laughs) I have no doubt we're going to have some fun today and folks are going to learn about yoga nidra, something that I've never talked about. I am so excited. Also so honored to be your first yoga nidra guest. I, we were chatting before this and I said, I love to be people's like gateway drug to meditation, but also to yoga nidra. I love first timers. Ah, It's good stuff because I fully disclose that I have never done yoga nidra. I have heard of it. I have completely been like, yes, people go get it. Sounds amazing. Um, And it's one of those cases in which I usually try everything before I recommend it. But in this case, I never had the opportunity because either the classes were while I was working or, you know, weekends were adventuring and I just couldn't make it work. So that's what happened in this case, but nevertheless, today we're going to, we're going to bring everybody, including myself up to speed. I love it. And I will email you an audio recording of a full yoga nidra practice so you can try it. Awesome. So you guys will get to hear what happened in that session at the end (laughs) of this podcast. I'll give you guys the full update. So, so tell us a little bit about how you came to develop a love for yoga nidra. When did you first try it? And and maybe even tell us what it is too, because I think in in this part I I might put a little teaser in the intro, but I think it'd be good for folks to know like what is yoga nidra and when did you first try it? So yoga nidra is this really beautiful practice where you it'll feel like a long guided meditation. You're going to lay there and listen to the sound of the facilitator's voice for. 30 to 60 ish minutes. And what you're doing is you're taking a conscious journey through what we call in the yoga world, your koshas. That's just a 
Sanskrit term for layer or sheath. And think about it as we have these different layers, right? It sounds cliche to be like, we're like an onion. You peel back these layers. I think of it as like those little Russian nesting dolls. You know, you have like the original and then all those other ones. And yoga nidra is a practice in which you're being led through our different layers. So it starts with the physical layer. So when you walk around, you see someone who say hi to them on the street, you're seeing their first kosha, their physical body. Then it goes a little bit deeper into their energetic body. Then you go into like their mental body, their thoughts. Then you go into their wisdom body, which I always think it's so interesting that your thoughts are not wisdom. You have to move past your thoughts to really get into wisdom. Then you move into your bliss body. And the thing that lies beyond that is the true self. And one of my favorite things to do is to help people connect with the true self. I think the more that we're connected with our true selves, kind of the magic of life unfolds, you're happier, you're more aligned with who you are. But the practice of Yoga Nidra is just this conscious journey through the different layers to bring you face-to-face with your true self, where you'll plant a positive seed of intention, or we call it a sankalpa. Um, That can be anything. It can be something very broad, something like... um, I move through life with confidence or it can be something really specific. Like I once did a private yoga nidra practice and our sankalpa was I walked down the aisle at my wedding with confidence and ease. She had very severe social anxiety. It can be like really specific, but you also get this beautiful benefit of having all of the kind of nervous system calming qualities of this practice. There's no movement. It's just, you lay in Shavasana you get set up like this little yoga sleepover. So you'll hear me on the recording. I'll send you, I'll say, get cozy. You can even do it in bed. If you want, you're going to lay there and you'll just start going through different exercises. You usually do a rotation of awareness through the body. You'll do a little bit of a calming breath, some kind of a breath technique. You'll do a little bit of emotion work. You do these opposing feelings and sensations, and then you go into some imagery And then once you're done with imagery, you plant that seed of intention and hopefully get a little time to be with your true self. So it's very calming, very relaxing. And yoga nidra, which translates to yogic sleep, um, it actually does help to improve your sleep quality and duration. And there's these really interesting studies that show when you're practicing yoga nidra, your body goes to sleep, but your mind still stays awake. So you get those really great restful qualities of having a deep relaxing experience. Kind of like I do describe it kind of like when you have acupuncture. Mm -hmm. So I love that we're talking about this together and you get to that really kind of like deep state where it's almost like one foot in the sleeping (laughs) world, but like one foot in the awake world. And you're kind of, you know, leaning forward and back in between these two worlds. Like that's physically where we get with yoga nidra. And then when we're in that relaxed state, we start unpacking some of those layers and coming face to face with the true self. Ooh, how cool. See, in my mind, and and this is this is good that now I'm knowing like yogic sleep. Okay, that makes sense to me. That kind of gives me a sense of like, oh, okay. So we're not going through all these yogic positions because I think a lot of people, you know, anytime there's yoga in front of something, you're gonna think that there's a bunch of different poses and things you have to do, right? So the fact that you don't have to do a bunch of poses that's cool. The fact it's that you're really I mean, cool. Shavasana is probably my favorite yoga position. <laughs> Just saying, I think a lot of people might like that one. Um, you know, it's, <laughs> It's all joking aside. Um, it's just the the most relaxing for me, right? And I think for a lot of people, just really laying down and getting that moment in the day to relax is awesome. Yes. But an alternative thought to that is I actually hear from a lot of people, Shavasana is the hardest for them because they, and this is usually, and, and I fall into this category. I used to be a Shavasana skipper. This was well before my yoga nidra days. <laughs> and to answer the short answer to when did I first get into yoga nidra? I want to say it was maybe 10 ish years ago. I tried it at a local yoga studio. And then when I did my second yoga teacher training for an additional 300 hours, it was part of the curriculum. And I was really like, oh my gosh, this is super interesting. And since I'm neurodivergent, I have ADHD. I love hyper fixation. So then I decided this was cool. I'm going to learn everything about it. And one thing led to another. And before you know it, now I lead yoga nidra teacher trainings, but I, I find that sometimes people struggle with the idea of yoga nidra because the idea of laying there with your thoughts, trying to relax for, you know, 
45 to 60 minutes kind of sounds like torture. When I first started doing yoga, granted, I was so young. My mom had to drive me to like my first yoga class. I was there for like, you know, the stretch for cross training for my sports. But when it was Shavasana time, I, I was so bold. I would roll up that mat and I would just walk out the door and be like, okay, I got what I needed. Goodbye. And like now as like, you know, a 30 something woman, I would never, I, I would never be so bold, but like a 14 year old at a yoga class, I'm like, bye, see ya. And I know for a lot of people, it's really, tr- it is hard to slow down and to even give yourself that time in a full, like 45 minutes. I mean, I have, you know, two, two kids, a three-year-old and a, you know, an infant and like 45 minutes, that sounds like a big time commitment. But the thing that is so cool is that even if that's hard for you, yoga nidra, it like, it holds your hand all the way through. There's not like, I'm just going to leave you with your thoughts. It's we're moving through the body. Now we're going to do some breath work. Now we're going to do that. Like it holds your hand all the way through. And what's really interesting is the time passes really quickly because we take in the sense of time through our senses. So, you know, I know that even when we're talking now, five minutes from now, I'll know, well, we were talking about this. Now we're talking about that time has passed, or I can see through my window trying on the day. Oh, it was light when we started. Now it's dark time has passed. And the thing that's really cool is when you're practicing yoga nidra, it's a really intense practice of what we call pratyahara. It just means withdrawal of the senses. So we are shutting our senses off. And so you don't understand the passage of time in the same way. And it goes by really quickly, which I think is super cool. And as someone again, who has ADHD and little kids overstimulation is like my jam. I live in like overstimulation city. And so to consciously shut down my senses feels phenomenal. Mm -hmm. I could see that. And that's probably why I like, um, working on being quiet and calm but you know because i realize i'm i'm not the same as everyone else but also i hear a lot of patients coming to me and saying like hey doc like i've tried this meditation thing i can't i don't know what to do really you know with my thoughts i don't know where to go with them and then you know what what if something you know is intense for me what where do i go from there so this sounds like the the process and i love that you're talking about the little russian dolls like the nesting dolls because it like taking one layer taking the other i mean it's it makes sense and, and such a great visual. So folks who are listening to this and going like, I don't know, I, I failed meditation, but this one might be good because you're talking me through things and we can yes. get past the senses of time. Mm-hmm. And I want to first circle back to those people who feel like they failed meditation because my first love is meditation. I am a meditation teacher. And what I would say, and I love people and I go to like a, a dinner party or something and they're, and they, people find out what I do. I, it's always going to happen. They'll go, Oh my gosh, that's so cool. I tried meditation once, but then I love hearing what follows the, but it's always something, but my brain is too busy, but I didn't like it, but I have ADHD, but I didn't know how to shut my mind off, but you know, insert whatever the reason is. And you can, you never fail meditation. It's just single pointed concentration. And chances are, you just haven't found the style that resonates with you yet. Meditation isn't about shutting off the brain or turning off your thoughts. It's about being able to get distracted and then come back get distracted, come back. It is training your mind to be able to focus on something for longer amounts of time. And so that might be every four seconds when you start, you get distracted, but then you come back. And then before you know it, it's every 10 seconds, maybe every 15 seconds. And if you're the person you're like, I didn't know what to do. um, I would go find a guided meditation and find something where just like with yoga nidra, they're going to walk you through the whole process. And I think you'll find a little bit more success, but I wanted to just speak to those people because I hear this all the time too. And you can never fail meditation. (laughs) Just like, you know, you can never fail acupuncture. You can never fail trying your best. You know, you know, you don't fail at that. No, it's, it's true. It's true. It's, it's one of these things where, you know, I think we just, we get in our heads a lot and we'll, we'll say different things and, and, you know, whatever happened, happened. Right. But, but I'm going to plug your (laughs) podcast right now. Cause guys, she has a podcast called mindfulness in minutes it's 20 minute guided meditations and like i think guided is a great way to go when you're really trying to dip your toes in and really get uh, a habit of slowing down happening 
I don't know how you feel about it, but obviously you've got your podcast. So my guess is it's probably something you would recommend. It is a thing that I love. And yes, mindful in minutes. It's all, there's even like five minute practices. It's all with the exception of a couple yoga nidras on there, which are longer. They're all less than 20 minutes. And the reason that I designed it that way is one, again, I have ADHD. I need, a, I'm a meditation teacher and I still like a short, get right to it practice. There's been different seasons in my life where I've liked longer right now. When I have, you know, primary parent to two little kids down and dirty is the way I like it right now in terms of meditation. But I also think that it's so special to have someone to walk you through the process, especially when you're starting and studies tell us we only need eight to 10 minutes a day to get the physical, mental, and neurological benefits of meditation. That's all that we need. And there's some really interesting research from Sarah Lazar coming out of Boston. And she's the one that looks at meditation in the brain and what's actually effective, what we actually need. And you only need 10 minutes. And I promise everyone can find 10 minutes, which is, you know, why seven years ago, which, you know, we both know is like geriatric for a podcast. (laughs) um, I started creating this thing, making these short guided meditations is it's all that you really need. Wow. Wow. Seven. I mean, I'm thinking seven years of, of podcasting. That's impressive. And then the the couple of minutes a day. I don't I think a lot of people really do get hung up on on the time frames. Cause if you search on YouTube, it yeah. you could look for a meditation at any certain minute, but you do see that there's a lot more that are like 20 minute plus in terms mm-hmm. of things. So you don't need that. That's huge. Yeah. That's huge. <laughs> yeah. So with yoga nidra being a little longer. I'm also going to kind of insert how often is it recommended to do something like yoga nidra? How would you incorporate it into your life? The way that I like to incorporate it, and you might get different answers from different teachers. The way that I personally like to use it is maybe a couple times a month. I think that it's something, it depends if I'm working with like a one-to-one client and they're working on something really specific, like the woman where we were working on her being able to walk down the aisle at her wedding and move past her social anxiety. That was something where she listened more frequently, kind of leading up to that actual day. Um, I do think that for a lot of people, once a month or maybe twice a month is really great and also realistic because it is a longer time commitment. You're going to need 45 to 60-ish minutes to do it. Um, But it's kind of up to you. I know a lot of people that have you know, some of my most popular podcast episodes are the yoga nidra for sleep. A lot of people will use it almost every night to listen to, to fall asleep, which isn't cheating. People will say, well, you know, is it cheating or does it, you know, it doesn't count if I don't listen to the whole thing. No, if your goal with yoga nidra is to fall asleep, then great. Then use it to fall asleep. That's great. That's amazing. Um, So people sometimes use it daily, especially if they're going to use it to fall asleep or when they're having a hard time sleeping. I personally feel like a couple times a month is really great. But one thing I want to flag for people is when you practice yoga nidra, something that will happen often is you will fall asleep. I do, um, you know, local pop-up classes here in Minneapolis where I am with yoga nidra. Someone will always fall asleep. Someone will always snore. People will say, what does that mean? And I'll say, it means you're tired. And that sounds like a joke or like a sassy answer. But if you do practice yoga nidra or you try it and you fall asleep, your body is always going to prioritize its basic needs being met like sleep over a conscious journey through the layers of your being to the true self. Your body doesn't need that to survive. It needs sleep to survive. So when people tell me, oh, I just, you know, I I don't do yoga nidra anymore because I just kept falling asleep. That means like if your intention is not to fall asleep, but you still do. My mom, who I love dearly, she cannot stay awake for a yoga nidra practice to save her life. She's usually the one snoring in these classes. I'm like, mom, get it together. Everyone knows who you are here because we look the same. And, (laughs) but it just means that I would prioritize sleep first, getting the rest your body needs. And we both know sleep is essential to everything. It is like the foundation. If you're not getting enough sleep, it's just this total trickle down effect to like everything going awry in your life. Um, So I do want to flag that for people. If you're starting to practice and you find you just can't stay awake for it, 
start prioritizing that rest, get that sleep in, you will get to a place where you'll be able to do the yoga nidra practice without falling asleep because that basic need is met. And then you can start embarking on the beautiful conscious journey to your truest self. Makes sense. Makes sense. Yeah. And in naturopath school and and acupuncture school, since I did at the same time, we often would have our Qigong classes where we would do different types of meditation. I was always the one sleeping. I was. Were you tired? Yeah, of course. Yeah. You were getting like dual degrees. You were working through all of that. Yeah. Yeah. Dual degrees. And I worked at a grocery store overnight. Um, so it was oh, a nightmare. You, a nightmare. Were, you were, we call that in my house, big tired. <laughs> you were big tired. <laughs> I was very big tired. I was very big tired. It makes me, it makes me laugh. Cause like, you know, my, my thought process was, well, it doesn't work because I fell asleep. Right. You know, but I, mm-hmm. I now understand and, and definitely glad you're reinforcing the fact that like, okay, work on sleep first, then work on getting to your true self. Now, yes. Let's talk about getting to your true self and and different purposes or maybe some case studies you have or patient stories or, or, or client stories, I guess I could say, in terms of what have you found yoga nidra to be most like life-changing for? Because I think a lot of people might be sitting here thinking like, okay, cool, you know, just another another way to meditate, you know, another way to get to my higher self. But like what kind of processes in life that we're trying to work out is yoga nidra? Like what does it shine for? Ooh, I love this question. I, okay. I'm going to take like a twofold approach on answering this. I'm going to say for the um, people that are there more for the physical, neither one of these is better or worse, but I would say a lot of times people come to yoga Nidra for two main components. One, they're there for the physical, which is going to be like yoga Nidra really shines when it comes to improving your sleep, um, restoration of like the tissues of the body, because again, your physical body is like falling, is going to sleep. And anyone who is, you know, a nerd like me, um, and loves like the science of sleep, it gets you to that, like deep sleep state for your body, which is where tissue regeneration is happening. It's so essential for like our hormone function. I mean, that deep sleep also light sleep really important too, because that's where we just rest. So a lot of people come for the physical benefits of like helping to regulate the nervous system, regeneration of the tissues, slowing down, getting rest, and just like chilling out for that time, which is huge. And I don't, I don't want it to come across like that's any greater or less than coming for what I would consider like the non-physical benefits. The yoga nidra really, really shines with helping. Like if you feel burnt out, you know, mind is fried. You're going a mile a minute. You you know, that feeling where you just, I imagine you see patients all the time. They're like, I'm like, I'm just run down. Like I'm dead. Mm -hmm. Like, I just, I feel like garbage. Like Mm -hmm. yoga Nidra is phenomenal for helping with that because you just calm down. You're restful, you're quiet, you're still, and you get that like regenerative process during the time. And then over time, it does help to improve your sleep, both you fall asleep faster and stay asleep longer. So it really shines for those physical benefits. And then on the other side of the coin, yoga nidra really shines for planting intentions, which is a piece of manifestation. And I don't know how you feel about manifestation, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. Um, And then helping people connect to their true selves. So I have had people have really interesting experiences where they felt like, they got messages from their higher self or their true self. They felt like loved ones had come in and, you know, were with them and helping them connect. They feel like they got the answers to, you know, big life questions they'd been sitting on and and pondering or considering for a long time. And I think that when we peel back these layers and we do consciously say, okay, I'm going to try to connect with my true self. We call it Atman and Yoga Nidra, like my soul. You can, you know, insert whatever word you like to use for that part of you, really magical stuff can happen. Even if you think about the true self as being like the most fertile soil that you could plant a seed of intention in, like going deep and kind of letting everything go, letting the walls come down, the senses shut down, external world fall away. You're going right to the source and saying, I'm going to plant a seed of intention. It can be anything of self-love, of confidence, of trusting my gut of, um, you know, being present, whatever it is, like 
that's incredibly powerful. And yeah, I find that sometimes it really shines for those really beautiful experiences that you can have when you're consciously trying to connect to that deeper, most true, authentic, like soul space stuff. It seems to me like if you're looking for answers, but one of the things you mentioned, you know, of course, yes, the the getting into the deep sleep part of the brain. I mean, that's huge because that's detox. There's so many benefits there. Like everything. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Every, like so beneficial. But what you mentioned too was getting into healing space, right? And you did say manifestation, love it. Um, I've not even talked about manifestation at all on this podcast. So this is great. This is two things we've I've never, <laughs> never talked about before. And, and I think, you know, a lot of people think about manifestation in terms of things they want. But one of the things that I've kind of started to really dive into to help patients and clients is, is health manifestation, manifesting, mm-hmm. you know, optimal health. And I'm sure with yoga nidra, this is possible just because I know of a couple programs we talked about earlier that's that's being used, a variety of it programs being used with military folks and a version of yoga nidra in that case because I see a lot of folks and and you probably have seen this over the years too where health is they just seem to be constantly in a struggle whether it's the thyroid or whether it's adrenals or whether it's an autoimmune condition, these kind of things seem to have some underlying connections to higher self. Have you worked with any folks in this department? Mm, Okay. Yes. I love this question. And what I will say is there's a lot of research on yoga nidra and PTSD, like specifically like complex PTSD. I personally do not do work with complex PTSD because I feel really strongly about staying in your lane and knowing your responsible scope of practice. Now, if someone comes and they have, you know, I don't want to say like run of the mill PTSD, that that sounds horrible, but you know, and and a lot of people I think do have these things and maybe they aren't aware of it. Um, But the reason that this is so great for PTSD and you see a lot of it being done, most of these studies are done by the VA are done, you know, with people who have served in the military is because when we think about PTSD, there isn't a physical wound that you're trying to heal, right? But there is obviously something that needs to be healed on a non-physical level. So the idea behind these studies is that if we can put the physical body or sort of the nervous system to sleep, then we can actually do some work and we can access that non-physical piece that needs to be healed or worked on, which I think is so interesting and also incredible. So I have had a lot of people that have come in and they maybe started with, you know, they're interested because there's always a stat that you'll hear that one 45 minute session of yoga nidra is like every yoga nidra class, like marketing ploy. I'll explain what it actually means in a moment, but one 45 minute yoga nidra session is equivalent to three hours of sleep at night. And that's a yes. And, or yes, but answer what they're trying to say is they're working with the actual like sleep ratios, because we know that you don't actually spend that much time in deep sleep at night, right? We have these sleep cycles and you're you know awake and then light sleep and then deep sleep and REM. And then you go back out and you're kind of, you know, kind of this little roller coaster up and down, up and down, up and down. Yoga Nidra is designed to take you from like awake to like boom, deep sleep really quickly. And you might spend 20 minutes in that deep sleep state, which is actually a lot of time in deep yeah. sleep compared to what you spend like at night. So that's why they say 45 minutes is equivalent to three hours. Do not try to like biohack your way out of sleeping and say, oh, instead of nine hours at night, I'll just do three back-to-back Yoga Nidra sessions. Don't do that. People ask me about this. They are convinced that this will work. It it will not. Don't use this to replace your sleep. But I have found people who come for the physical benefits, um, wanting to calm down, regulate their nervous system, um, you know, just have a good relaxing time, all of that. A lot of times they find, um, they just find something deeper or they find that when they did calm down, Maybe something bubbled up to the surface. Maybe they realized there was work that needed to be done in a different area. Maybe they started, I've had people often tell me, I started thinking about something that I thought I was over that I hadn't thought about for like years. 
And then I was in that relaxed state. And all of a sudden this thing that I went through as a child kind of popped up, not even necessarily in like a scary way, but they kind of realized like, huh, maybe that isn't gone. That's just been like deeply buried or I've been moving a million miles a minute. And, and this happens with meditation too, trying to just push down what's actually happening within. They say, quiet the mind and the soul shall speak, but it's really like quiet the mind and everything just starts screaming at you. And so when you slow down in that way with yoga nidra, people do often say that, you know, they kind of noticed what was happening beneath the surface for better or for worse. And that gives them a lot of information as to what's actually happening within them and their higher self. You know, I like to think of it as like your emotional self or like your mental self. You realize, oh, I just, I couldn't stop thinking about um, the donut that I ate earlier today. And I was really still beating myself up about that. Don't you kind of that food chatter, that food guilt even things like that were like, gosh, I just, I was here to relax. And I just couldn't stop thinking about how quote bad of me it was to eat that. Mm-hmm. And like, that's really informative too. Even those kind of little, you know, information downloads that you get of like, I'm still worried about that thing. You know? Yeah. Yeah. No, I've been there. <laughs> I've been there having self-proclaimed f- food issues. I definitely been down that pathway. Uh- you and I have a lot in common because <laughs> yeah, I mean, same, the food, the food noise, as they call it, is very, very, very real. It's, it's super real. And I think a lot of women in particular, I, I can't speak for men, but women in particular, I do think we have a lot of that going on that probably hijacks more of our ability to be our true self and probably hijacks a lot of our health potential too, in my mind. Mm. Mm, yes, I think I would agree with that. And and that's one of the things that I really do love about both meditation and yoga nidra is that you really, you can't notice those things that are a little bit more of like a subtle level until you just kind of get off that hamster wheel and stop and say, what's like, what's actually happening here? You can't do that until you get to that more relaxed state because our bodies are moving around every day, trying to help us survive. They're using our senses to, you know, take in this big, loud world around us. And it's really hard to actually unpack some things or access those deeper parts of ourselves unless we're consciously slowing down and turning inward. Yeah, we, I mean, it's, it's so wild how important this has become, you know, in a, in our society. Right. And I know folks are talking about it left and right, but I think there's still quite a few people who haven't quite bought in to slowing down. I mean, I, myself, I'll be honest, probably in the last couple of years, I've really started to, to value it. So it's like, and I'm a medical practitioner, (laughs) right? So that's terrible. And an acupuncturist. Well, have you noticed anything since you started to embrace it? Like, have you noticed any changes within yourself? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm i so much more aware of how I talk to myself, especially about food and things, right? <laughs> but also so much more aware of where my body's like, I don't like that. I like this. Don't do that anymore. Let's go this direction. You know, it's it's just much more direction is what I gather yeah. from it just pathways and and it doesn't always seem linear, but it's always like I do get insights when I can slow myself down and and work on things, especially, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about it like, wow, well, I've been doing this kind of on different guided meditations, but I'm kind of thinking in my mind to have it where it's set up strategically like yoga nidra to work through the different layers. I'm like, that sounds so much more effective for someone. Mm, I do think that it, I think of meditation as being like the kind of constant communication that you could have with, you know, your soul, your true self, your higher self, whatever you want to call it. It's kind of like, if you think of your overall being as like a workplace, it's kind of those quick, like check-ins, like, Hey, just wanted to let you know, you know, I have this coming up. This is how I'm feeling about it. Or, Hey, did you get this thing done? It's like those little quick little conversations where like yoga nidra is kind of like the big meeting. You don't need to do it all the time, but sometimes you need to, you know, you have a set intention and you're like, I'm going to do this and we're going to spend more time. We're going to work on this thing. And yeah, that's what I think about meditation is just kind of like the daily check-in, but then you have yoga nidra as kind of the like monthly meeting or, you know, 
bi-weekly meeting that you can do that has like a really specific agenda to it. That is by far the most awesome explanation <laughs> oh. I've ever heard. I'm like, okay, perfect. Just my just my check-ins and then my monthly, like we either come to Jesus meeting or it's like a, a good bring it all together meeting. I like it. How I have a question for you. It, it, it's Kelly, how long has yoga nidra been around? Is this thousands of years? Is this hundreds of years? Like what's the history on it in terms of time frame? Mm. Oh, okay. I love to tell this story. So buckle up everyone. You're, you know, we're going to take a little, a little journey here for this story. So it, it depends with a lot of things kind of depends the practice itself ancient. I mean, but it's also something we have to remember that this was practiced during a time where it was kind of like, you know, being passed down orally. It was really just like men who had devoted themselves to these types of practices. You know, this was something that the idea, like it goes all the way back to the Vedas actually, where they talk about this fifth dimension of sleep, or um, there's basically the idea of like, you can have, you have sleep for like sleep and rest, but then there would be these stories, different deities being to act, being able to access this fifth dimension of sleep, where it's kind of like a intentional, like consciousness type of sleep. It's like the idea of being able to conquer sleep for higher consciousness. Like that's not, that's thousands and thousands, but that is old, very old. The actual practice of like, here's yoga nidra that's actually quite new, especially in the yoga space. This is going to go back to Swami Rama. And he was practicing, I guess, one step before that, um, one of Swami, Swami Rama's teachers, um, his name is failing me right now. So I, I apologize. It's going to come to me at, as soon as we, you know, and I literally teach this stuff. And so the minute that we, you know, end this call, it's going to come to me and I'll, you know, whatever. That's how it always happens. But one of Swami Rama's teachers was at an ashram and he had this interesting experience where he had to wake up at 4 a.m. to do mantra repetition. And he was tired as the story goes. I think this is so relatable. He was tired. He went down 4 a.m. and they were doing mantra repetitions for several hours. He fell asleep. And when he woke up towards the end of the mantra repetitions, he was new here. So he didn't know the mantras yet. He could complete the final few rounds. And so he was like, wait a minute, how did I fall asleep, but yet absorb all of this information? And he kind of unlocked this idea that there is a way for you to put your body to sleep, but to keep your mind open to absorb information. And he really became interested in what we now call the practice of yoga nidra. So he started sharing that with his students. And then Swami Rama is the one who took it. And then in the seventies, they studied it. There's this really interesting picture that floats around the internet of him wearing this electroencephalograph. It's the big hat with all the wires that goes on your head. Okay. So he's wearing one of those and there's these like researchers there for some reason he's wearing a speed. Oh, I don't know why he was wearing the speedo for this test. That part's never been explained to me, but it's this really kind of like iconic photo in like the yoga nidra world of he's in his speedo and you know, it's all the wires. And then these researchers in like white coats are taking pictures. Anyway, it's very fun. And they did an interesting study where they had Swami Rama put himself into a state of yoga nidra, which I would say is extremely advanced. Usually you need someone to put you into that state. It's not something you're just like, okay, I'm going to snap my fingers and go into the state of yoga nidra. Um, but he did it. And they asked him a series of random questions, you know, who's the president? What's your favorite color? I don't know all these different questions. And then when he came out of yoga nidra, they asked him to answer the questions and he was able to answer them. And they were just a series of random questions. And they were like, that's weird because your body and your brain, like physically you were supposed to be in deep sleep, but somehow you're able to not only recall the information that we ask, but then be able to like, then answer it at a later time. Um, he's really the one that made yoga nidra more like mainstream, if you will, and created the blueprint or the framework of you do the body, then you do the breath, then you do the emotions, then you do the imagery. Like he is the one that really gave us the kind of package thing that you can go and you can take a training in now to create your own yoga nidra scripts or practices. Um, wow. So I don't know. I just, I love that. So I think it's so relatable. If I had to go and do mantra repetitions at 4 a.m., and I was the new guy, you know, on the block, and I might fall asleep too. Like, I think that's so, re so relatable. And, then, <laughs> and there's just, I don't know, there's actually a lot of lore 
and yoga nidra. And that was just in the seventies, which like in the yoga world, Swami Rama, um, that's really young. That's yeah. really new. You think about, you know, Patanjali, like the grandfather of yoga, that's thousands and thousands of years old, but like we have actual photographs of researchers studying yoga nidra. So it's just a baby in the yoga world, but it's cool. I, you know, I think it- these things are probably released or come to, let's say, popularity when they're needed, right? If we talk manifestation mm-hmm. or something of that nature, <laughs> probably he was probably wearing a Speedo, my guess would be, so that they could show that he had nothing, like he wasn't <gasps> cheating, like he's not oh, cheating. Oh, I wonder. Okay. Yeah. Yes. I've never thought of that before. This is something when we do yoga nidra teacher training, we always love to have a good giggle and like theorize, like what, what was the brief for this like research, yeah. you know, where they're like, we need you here. You're going to get a, you know, state issued speedo. I don't know, whatever it is, but it's, <laughs> we do like to take a moment mm-hmm. to theorize, you know, oh but I gosh. think, I think you're onto something. Yeah. Yeah. I was thinking maybe there's just like showing that there's no device on him to like yeah i don't know who knows who knows yeah no recording device or something maybe right or like something that would like change his energetics like some type of vibrational energetic shift i don't know but fascinating fascinating so of course you've discussed that you are a teacher and you also have a mentorship and private sessions as well and you do retreats which by the (laughs) way those look fascinating too so i want to talk about those because a lot of folks Let's put it this way. When I when I talk about different things that are out there, right? A lot of folks are like, sounds cool, but maybe I could try them on a one-on-one basis versus going with a group of other folks. So that's one thing I absolutely hear. So I want to hear how your private sessions work. And then retreats. I mean, what a better place. And, and a lot of people will, it, it, I have some people in my practice that go to ashrams. There's one in Tennessee. I don't know. A lot of people go to Tennessee for one. I don't know it, okay. but they but they go there. Um, I don't know what happens there. Um, but <laughs> so you have to I ask have to, them. Well, I mean, it's a silent, it's a silent ashram, and you have to yeah. be quiet. That's all I know. So I'm like, I don't know what else happens when you're quiet. I mean, when you're silent, other than working on mind stuff, right? We're working on those things, and and so well, I can tell you because I've done that. I've yeah. taken a couple of vows of silence. <laughs> I can tell you what happens. What happens? <laughs> So when I was learning a specific style of loving kindness meditation, it's called TWIM, Tranquil Wisdom Insight Meditation. I was living in Missouri, the North part of Missouri at the time. And I found these monks on the internet. I was in like my early twenties. I started emailing them. One thing led to another and they said, Hey, why don't you come down and like, come, you know, stay with us for a little while. We'll teach you the style of meditation. My mom was convinced I, that it was a serial killer. And then I was going to go to like the woods and that was going to be the end of my life. End of my time. Um, would mom me maybe let my kids go do that now? Maybe not. But you know, I was in my early twenties. I was on the spiritual journey. I threw caution to the wind. It ended up being phenomenal, completely life changing experience. So I did go to. It wasn't Tennessee. It was Southern Missouri in the Mark Twain Forest, and I did have to take a vow of silence. They also they take all your devices. You're not allowed any form of communication. So no books to read, no journaling, no phones. But I told them. I had to keep my phone because I promised my mom I would check in every night and let her know I was still alive. And they made an exception for mom. <laughs> Cause they, you know, I just explained to them the situation. They were like, okay, just promise you won't use it. And then, you know, each day just let mom know you're doing okay. But basically what our days looked like is we'd wake up in the morning, 5 a.m. We'd go to meditation hall. We'd have kind of, you know, work on our meditation from five to about 8 a.m. And you could get up, break up your sitting meditation with like a walking meditation. We'd have breakfast. Then we would have a chore that we would be assigned. And this could be anything. At one point I had to weed um, in between these little like stepping paving stones that led from the meditation hall to the restroom, you know, those little like blocks of stone and all those little weeds like to grow around them. And I was on hands and knees just pulling out each one. Sometimes I'd you know, do dishes. Sometimes I'd sweep the meditation hall. You do your chore. Um, then you have another meditation session and then lunch and then a little bit of rest time and afternoon meditation session. Um, we only had two meals a day, so we didn't do dinner. And then we could have tea and then an evening like talk. And um, then you go to bed and, and then you do it all over again. And the thing that's really interesting about the silent retreat is a few things happen. One, the first few days are the worst because they're the most uncomfortable, I should say. They are the worst for me, right? I am a Gemini with ADHD and now I didn't have a podcast then, but like 
I was born with the gift of gab. It's what we, it's what we do. Okay. And so, (laughs) and so to just not speak. And I was so interested. I wanted to ask these people that I, how did you get here? Why were you led, you know, to, to take this life? What so many questions were in my mind and it was really hard to not ask questions, not be inquisitive. And it felt awkward. I would be, you know, you'd be walking on a path and maybe this is, you know, I'm in Minnesota. So maybe it's a Midwest thing. I don't know, but you see them and like, it's rude to not acknowledge the person, you know, even just a little, like, you know, that little half smile, a little wave. Yeah. No communication. So you weren't, you just head down, just keep walking. You're sitting at meals, silence. That's the part that feels weird when we are socially ingrained to chit chat and have small talk. You don't do any of that. It feels uncomfortable, but a few things really start to happen. That's incredible. One, those things get in place, get replaced with something more intentional. So at lunchtime, instead of, you know, small talking, we sat there and we were supposed to reflect on all of the hands that had touched this food before it was on our plate. So all like everything, all the way down from the sun shining down on the tomato plant, making it grow to the hands that picked the tomato. And then the other person who packaged it and then the truck driver who drove it to the grocery store and, you know, the 16 year old kid who was probably just slapping, you know, carts of tomatoes on the shelves and, you know, all of the, everything for everything you were eating, which to this day is still one of my favorite practices. If you've never done it, do it. It's really powerful. Take one meal in silence and the whole time reflecting on what was the process and who had to work hard to bring you that nourishing meal right then and there. It's a beautiful practice. Um, doing the chores silently, that was tough. Um, but then I started finding some kind of joy in it. I'd be picking these little weeds and I'd notice like, oh my gosh, that's so interesting. This weed has like a flower on it. This weed has, you know, this shape leaves and you find like this little joy. And then you start to notice how much you are talking just to fill space, to just make noise, to avoid silence. And you find a comfort in the discomfort of silence. And it's really beautiful. And the first like 48, 72 hours, definitely very uncomfortable. And then you just settle into it. And it's like this relief. You're like, I don't have to talk to anyone. I don't have to communicate to anyone. I can just be in this little bubble. And the hardest part is when you're done and you go home and you reacclimate to everyday life. It is such a loud, busy, overstimulating world. Like you need a reintegration time back into everyday life after you've taken that vow of silence. So that was my experience. I don't know about Tennessee, but you should ask. I imagine they do some similar things. I'm gather. I I would gather so. Oh, that sounds so fascinating. I mean, my life in Central Wisconsin, and then going to to Seattle and SeaTac Airport is like that. <laughs> You're just like Milwaukee Airport, super chill. There's like 20 people there. They're all drinking beer. It's wonderful. You get on like the airplane. You're fine. Whatever. Mm-hmm. You got your four hours of silence, and then you hit SeaTac. It's like life, yeah. people yeah. everywhere. You're like. I got to mm-hmm. integrate, integrate back in. But yeah, I, I could see, I, I've never spent that much time quiet because yes, I also have the gift of gab and be very, it's, I'm, I'm intrigued. Now I'm also intrigued at 20, early twenties, not yeah. many people will go down a spiritual journey, especially someone from the Midwest at that, because at least where I grew up, you know, meditation, even acupuncture. I was on the fringe. My mom was on the fringe trying these things out. What what provoked it? What was the background, if you don't mind sharing with us? Um, I didn't have any friends. <laughs> and I I really didn't. <laughs> I that was honestly one big factor. I was alone and lonely. And I think that now being in my early thirties. I now know there's a way to be alone without being lonely. I didn't know how to do that. I was deeply lonely. I, we had shared a little bit off mic when I was 16, my mom had stage three breast cancer. I was her primary caregiver that, I mean, you can't go through something like that and not have it change your life. It also was like in the thick of high school. I didn't really get that high school experience because there was something so much bigger happening in my life. And then I went to college and I just felt like that it wasn't for me. Um, a traditional learning setting isn't necessarily my bread and butter, just the way that I learn. I now know, you know, I have ADHD and dyslexia. And so I just need to learn in a different way. I didn't really know that about myself. I was struggling with 
food stuff, we'll call it, um, you know, the big early twenties question of who am I, what do I want to do with my life was all kind of swirling in there. And then I did meet my now husband in, in college and he is a DO actually. And he got into medical school in Missouri. So we moved there and it's like this one bar, one Walmart town. And I had to leave my job. I had to leave, you know, like the very few friends I had, they weren't that close of friends, family, everything and start over. And he was just immersed fully in school. And it was me. And we just gotten our dog, our little puppy and, and nothing. And I had taken a yoga teacher training. I was, you know, teaching it on the side for fun. But the thing that I'll say about 10 years ago, what I do now, it it's maybe cool to some people now. It was not cool when I did it 10 years ago. It was like, oh my gosh, what a weirdo. That's not a real job. You know, teaching yoga is so beneath you. It was really, I mean, really not a great supportive environment at that time pursuing what I wanted to pursue. And so I really just started taking this journey to find myself, to find answers, to feel better. I didn't I didn't know what I needed to feel better. I didn't even know what it was. I just knew I didn't feel good. I didn't know who I was. I wasn't happy. And so I just started on that journey. And like the only way that I knew how was through yoga and ultimately through meditation. And I don't know. I, I, I find people, this was my own experience. And a lot of people come to me like, and I I imagine like people come to acupuncture or, you know, naturopathic medicine, like they don't, come to these things when things are all going well. Right. Because if everything's great and dandy and awesome, you're not looking for ways to improve upon yourself, to connect with your true self, to find deeper meaning in things, because you're just chugging along, doing fine. It's when things aren't fine and you kind of get to this, well, I'll try anything mindset, that then you really start to dabble in this stuff. And it's really interesting because it wasn't until I connected to you know, kind of full circle it to yoga nidra. It wasn't until I found out who I was as a person and I got to know myself that my people started to come. Mm -hmm. And that's, and so I really feel like I found my people and my friends and my community later in life in my like mid, but more like late twenties and into early thirties. And it's because I took this journey to get to know myself. And then that kind of attracted than my community and my people. And so I'm so grateful for, you know, everything that happened that led me to that point. And that's where I really landed on this idea within myself that like, you can be alone without being lonely. You're never really alone because you always have yourself, especially if you know them, it does feel like a close companion. Oh, wow. That is, that's so profound because yeah you know i'm I'm speechless only because it's true when you get to know your true self it's like having your friend there you don't need necessarily anyone else but granted like having friends and finding your crew so Mm -hmm. important and i think that is just such an important point for folks to hear is the more you know yourself the more you're going to attract like back to manifestation where you're going to manifest the friends that get you yes and i think the ones that like elevate you in a way Like the kind where you just feel better when you're around them because they are people who are also connected to their true selves, who are also authentic, who know themselves, who value themselves. Like when you do that for yourself, those are the people that you will then attract. And it just feels good to be with loving people like that. Absolutely. Absolutely. And as we get older, I mean, it is harder to find friends. It's it's a lot harder to find people that you really resonate with. And, and I know that personally in my practice, I have a couple of patients who are really struggling to find friends. And I think it's one of the things where we got to go back to being our own really good best friend first, which I know for myself has been hard for many yeah. years. <laughs> <laughs> Same. <laughs> So huge. So huge. So I'm 
I know that a lot of folks listen to this podcast because like, they are on a health journey. They're trying to find, <laughs> you know, something that resonates with them, something to create an optimal health protocol to as well. And and so I do want to talk about your traits a little bit because yeah. I do find it fascinating. Definitely want to tell folks how they can work with you. And then your book too, because I'm guessing that you're teaching your kiddos how to meditate as well. Yes. So we can start with the books and then I want to, I want to touch on retreats too, because that's actually where I met my best friend was on a retreat, like my best, best friend. And it's a place where really beautiful connections are made. I think that's one of the kind of unspoken benefits of a retreat is like you're in a group of like-minded people having the shared experience and there's really beautiful bonds that are formed there. Um, but so I have, I have two books, two book babies, if you will. The first is called mindful minutes meditation for the modern family. That's my first book. And I wrote it as a way to help families in a really easy, digestible, simple way, learn how to weave meditation and mindfulness into the family system at any age, all the way from you're expecting to you have teenage kids and then how can you use it to support yourself as a parent? Because being a parent is freaking hard. It is hard and you need to support yourself too, because you can't show up as the person you want to be for your kids if you can't take care of yourself first. Mm -hmm. um, so the way that book is broken up is the first half is kind of meditation 101, how to talk to your kids about meditation, how to weave this stuff into your life as a family. And then there's like 35 different topics anxiety, resilience, courage, stress, change, so many different things that pop up in your household. There's some reflections on that, learnings I've had, lessons, things like that. And then there's three guided practices, one for little ones, like your little, little ones, one for adolescents, and then one for teens and adults to help support under that particular topic. And then some mantras that you can use together to follow. And in terms of the little ones and in my household, I love meditation for pregnancy and postpartum. Mm. I think it's a great way to connect with baby, get to know them before they're even here, and then to care for yourself after baby is there. And again, you only need a few minutes because like, you know, those early days of postpartum, you better believe my, my eight minutes, that is like, that is hard to get, but, but I'm going to get it. And I've really been trying to weave sort of some foundational mindfulness principles into my kids at a young age. So things like being able to connect with their breath to calm down their nervous system. My oldest is three. He's like, you know, high octane emotion all the time. He's also a little Scorpio. Any of my astrology people out there, he's a three-year-old Scorpio. Okay. So he has deep feelings. He is feisty. And so helping him to connect with his breath or to be able to say, okay, close your eyes look on the inside. What feeling are you feeling? Like emotional literacy, emotion identification, like really simple. We have this thing called the breathing ball. It's one of those collapsible, you know, you can like kind of open it up and like it expands and then you, you know, put it together and it makes like a small, the breathing ball will take a big breath in when we open the ball, big breath out when we close the ball. These really simple things that we don't think about as like quote meditation, like it really is foundational work. And I think about what if I had those tools in my toolbox my little one's going to start preschool next week. And like, you know, what if I had those tools in my toolbox when I was in preschool or when I was a seventh grade girl, which is like mm -hmm. the worst thing you can ever be in life. Like what if I had those tools in my toolbox, even if it's just simple foundational things like that. So that book is all about, you know, how you navigate that. The second one is called You Are Not Your Thoughts. It is for meditation and anxiety. And I created that based on the severe postpartum anxiety I had after my son was born and the method I kind of came up with to make sure I had a different experience when my daughter was born, which I'm happy to report very different experience. Again, the way that I like to learn is just diving in head first and looking at meditation in the brain, all sorts of different elements to meditation and anxiety. And then there's eight weeks of um, a daily meditation practice, a journal prompt that relates that meditation practice and a mantra. And each week is something different. So you start with getting a clear picture of anxiety, then how does your body respond? What are your thoughts like? What about your emotions? And they play on one another. Um, and the reason I picked eight weeks is because studies tell us that the amygdala actually begins to respond, which the amygdala is the pain, fear, worry, anxiety center of the brain. It actually begins to atrophy and have smaller physiological anxiety responses after eight weeks of daily meditation. So that's why I picked that length. Um, so that's my other book, baby, for my anxious, you know, girls and gals and anyone else out there. Oh my gosh. I... 
I'm big on why are we not teaching this in preschool? I am because this yeah. stuff like and I mean the way you're presenting it, not some watered down version of it. I think it's very important because, yeah, like how much could you save girls, young girls and, you know, sixth, yeah. seventh, eighth grade from all the things that mm -hmm. mess with oh. you? Oh, yeah. That's like I don't know anyone who isn't still like traumatized by like sixth to seventh grade, especially women. And I think about like my son. And to me, I think a big piece that's missing for like little boys is that emotional literacy. You know, we're very much just like, oh, well, you know, boys, they're just all rough and tumble and smash and scream. And, and like, I mean, they kind of are, but also give them the tools to understand like, why they want to do that. Like that's such a foundational piece of even it's, it's okay. If you're mad, we all get mad, right? Their brains aren't even formed yet, but give them the tools to be like, you know, even that pause for just a second and be like, huh, why, why did I throw this truck at my sister? Which is something that just happened. Oh, it's because I was mad. She was in my space. Like those are tools we need to teach our kids too. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. If nothing else, I'm hoping some folks who are in the space where that can make, make change, help us make change, get the, the, your books into, into the, the learning space. It's so important. All right. So, so retreats, we keep talking retreats. about that. where are we okay. going? Where, where do okay. we have your retreats? Where are we going retreats. on? Retreats. So depending on when this episode is released, if anyone's like a last minute kind of a person, you could come with me to Iceland in October or it's the Aurora's and Awakening retreat. So we're going to see the Northern Lights every day. It's like, I love, I mean, I'm biased. I love my retreats because I think it's the best of both worlds of like, you're getting a yoga and meditation retreat. And you also get to be a tourist in this place. So we start with like morning yoga and meditation. We'll do workshops and like things like connecting to your true self. And also we'll go do a golden circle tour because when in Iceland, you need to go see the amazing things. And so that's a five-day retreat in Iceland. And then next May, we have the Wild and Wondrous Woman Retreat in Scotland. So we're going to just go and connect with like our truest selves, just be women, existing, connecting, um, you know, letting our kind of wild run free. And like I said, you know, you do get the really beautiful aspect of like being able to disconnect, to be in a beautiful setting to have the kind of people always tell me, they're like, it's so great. Cause this is the kind of vacation where I come back feeling better. I don't come back feeling, you know, we have like nutritious meals, all that. I don't come back feeling tired, hungover, bloated. And you know, like I need a vacation. It's like truly like restorative, which is so beautiful. And they get to be a tourist as well. And talking about kind of friendship and connection. Some of the most beautiful friendships I've seen have been formed on these retreats because you're getting together with people who you, and a lot of people come alone. That's always the question. Well, I'm traveling alone. Is that okay? Almost everyone comes alone and they come and they're meeting people, usually other women that love something that they love, are interested in the place that they're interested in. And we have all of our meals together. And I've seen really beautiful friendships form on these retreats. And I actually met my best friend on my very first Iceland retreat years ago. Um, she's now my work best friend. She does all my retreat logistics and is my best friend and is actually my daughter's godmother. Um, but we met on what we call our blind date in Iceland. We planned this retreat over Zoom before COVID. So that wasn't like really a thing. And then we met each other for the first time in the Catholic airport. Oh my gosh. And like, you know, it was like our blind date, our origin story, but truly it just, we had so much in common and just felt so comfortable and like magical things happen on these retreats. Hmm. Sounds amazing. Sounds amazing. And what cool places too. Just wanted folks to hear that as well. Thank so, you. and they can also work with you with a mentorship capability and private sessions too. And they can reach out to you um, as well via the website, correct? Yeah. The website or email info at yoga Um, But yeah, start at the website. All the things are there. Retreats are there. The podcast is there. The books are there. Just go there, click around, see what speaks to you. <laughs> and yoga for you online.com, right? That's the website. That's it. Let's make sure. That's it. Yeah. yeah. Right. Awesome. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Kelly, so much good stuff, deep stuff here. I think a lot of folks are going to love just hearing how yoga nidra is something that they can work to, you know, I like it meditation for like the daily bits and then the yoga nidra for the big like meeting. The, the come to meeting, come to, G I said come to Jesus meeting, but whatever, it could be your, your monthly you board that. meeting. Yeah. Could be your board meeting. Also 
It's Krishna Macharya. So can you clip? That was the person I was trying to think of. You know, you can leave it in this way or just clip me saying Krishna Macharya and put it in when I said it's it's escaping me right now. And you can, you know, clip it in there. But I knew when we were done, it would come to me. So nice Krishna Macharya, we have to thank for coming up uh, with this idea. The body's asleep, but the mind's awake. Got it. Got it. Oh my gosh, you're so funny. I'll I'll edit it. I'll I'll put it into where it is. And then I'll probably make a funny note about like she was trying to remember and then she got it at the end. So we just inserted this here. Oh, feel free to roast me. It's all all jokes here. You know, who doesn't love a good laugh? Oh goodness. Kelly, thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. Oh, thank you for having me. I've just had so much fun chatting with you and I appreciate you sharing this this space with me. My pleasure. Hey, fellow health junkie, thanks for listening to the Health Fix podcast. If you enjoyed tuning in, please help support me to get the word out about the podcast. Subscribe, rate, and review, and just get that word out. Thanks again for listening.